Coming to you from Jacksonville, Florida, this is GovLove, a podcast of local government brought to you by engaging local government leaders. I'm Ben Kittleson, Senior Consultant at RefTels and GovLove co-host. We've got a great a great episode for you today. We're going to be talking Elk Grove and I and APA. But first, the best way to support GovLove is to become an ELGL member. Engaging Local Government Leaders is a professional association engaging the brightest minds in local government. Uh, and your membership helps support this podcast. So if you love GovLove, the best way to show it is to become an ELGL member. Now, let me introduce today's guest. Ash Kumar is a management analyst in the city manager's office at the city of Elk Grove, California. Uh, she's been in that role since July of 2022. Uh, previously, she worked as an operations analyst and ICMA fellow for the city of Decatur, Georgia. Uh, and she was in Decatur for about four years. Um, Ash is also the president of the International Network of Asian Public Administrators. Uh, she has her MPA from the University of Pittsburgh and studied urban and regional planning at SEPT University in India. Uh, welcome to GovLove, Ash. Thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me, Ben. Cool. So our, our, our listeners know uh, one of our um, traditions is to do a lightning round to get to know our, our guests a little better. So my first question for you, uh, what book are you currently reading? So my colleague and I are launching our new in-house innovation academy for city employees, which starts this fall. And as awesome. part of our preparations, we have curated a list of over 100 books that we think will be great resources for the academy. So before recommending it to our employees, we need to read them all. So among the books on the list, I'm currently reading Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. Nice. Any other highlights from the list? Yeah, that, so many. That we people. should we should check out or? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we got this list from. Uh, so, so a similar program is hosted by Denver. They have mm-hmm. a program called the Peak Academy, and we found a lot of great resources on their website. So I would cool. recommend checking it out. In addition to the list of books, they have some great resources for everyone in local government. Awesome! Awesome. All right, so uh, my next line error question for you, what's the first concert that you went to? So I don't remember the first one that I went to uh, in India, but the first concert I went to in the U.S. was when I went to see Poppy, formerly known as That Poppy, in Atlanta, Georgia, with my favorite firefighter, Gary Menard, and his wife, Erin. And it's it was um, pop music with heavy metal. So very engaging, great audience, and a great performance by Poppy. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, a fun first show. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so my next line I crush for you, what's the last thing, you know, movie, TV show that, that you watched? So we just finished uh, the fourth and final season of Never Have I Ever. On Netflix. Oh, so good. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My, so, my husband and I speak different South Indian languages. Um, mm-hmm. But because the lead of this show is also, she has a South Indian heritage, so we could relate with her and her um, story a lot. We, we really enjoyed the show. We wish there could have been another season, but uh, it was it was great. Yeah. I was like, I, that show I wish was uh, could go on forever. And also that they had like 20 episodes a season instead of like just 10. But Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Then my last let, let question for you. Where, where do you go for inspiration? Um, I'm inspired by people around me a lot. I'm a part of the strategic planning and innovation division in the city manager's office. So we get a lot of interesting projects and ideas. Um, but I go to my family for keeping me grounded. I, I always say that they are my compass. They, they keep me um, on track and um, they, they make sure that I have the mirror in front of me if um, I'm, I'm doing something crazy. I'm very sensitive and emotional. I'm very extroverted. So with all that being as the combination, it helps to have a compass uh, to keep me grounded. Yeah. Awesome. That's great. Um, so, you know, uh, close listeners to the bottle know one, one of my favorite things to ask is like how people ended up in, in this career and, and in their current role. So for you, um, what was your path into local government? Um, how did you kind of end up in, in Elk Grove? Yeah, that's a great question. While I was working on my thesis for undergrad school, I started preparing for the GRE exam to start grad school. Um, And my thesis was uh, focused on governance issues in smaller cities of India. 
So the University of Pittsburgh, with its Center for Metropolitan Studies, was very attractive to me in terms of the research that I could do. So I continued some of my research work here after I got admitted to the school, and I found an amazing internship through the local government academy in Pittsburgh, and I worked with an awesome supervisor, Susan Hockenberry, at the Quaker Valley Council of Governments. So cool. this experience marked my entry into the field of local government. Yeah. So what, what made you want to study, you know, uh, I think I think it was, was it, did you say planning or small cities in India? What, what, what got you interested in that topic as, as kind of a, the initial entry into eventually local government? Yeah, I come from a small city in India, but I went to study in a larger city in Ahmedabad in the western part of India. So Mm -hmm. knowing that I could go to the smaller city, interact with government officials, once I started having those conversations, it sparked an interest in comparing my city with other similar sized cities, not just the one that I was um, living in uh, Mm -hmm. at the dorm. So that experience, I think it really helped me with knowing more about, so what what are other cities all over the world doing? Smaller cities, the resources might be limited. Uh, There might be issues um, that are based on corruption or other things, getting the funds from the central government, which is similar to the federal government here. How are they working with those challenges? Uh, I, I think that's what got me curious uh, to learn more about smaller cities and then moving on to metropolitan research and um, cities all over the world. Yeah. Well, and um, I know like as I've kind of learned more about, you know, topics in local government, like you, you find out about like international examples of like how housing and planning works in other places. And you're like, what, you know, maybe sometimes the U.S. is an outlier and sometimes there's great yeah. ideas in, in other places. I'm curious how like your, your background in, in India and having studied local government and planning there, how, how has that kind of helped or informed kind of your work um, for cities in the U.S.? Yeah, studying urban planning in India has definitely shaped my work and career in many ways. Um, It has provided me with a strong foundation in understanding the complex challenges and uh, dynamics of urban environments. Hmm. It also exposed me to different planning theories, policies, as I said, best practices that are applicable globally. And the broad perspective allows me to bring a diverse range of ideas and approaches to my work, uh, fostering innovation and creative problem solving. So um, something that maybe wasn't an, uh, an approach that we would have thought of earlier could be something that was done in India. And it makes me think, okay, maybe we can make it work here. Of course, there are different challenges here. So changing it, uh, allowing it to be flexible and mm. and addressing the challenge in a different way. And also studying urban and planning in India, I think it exposed me to the unique urbanization patterns and rapid urban growth prevalent in the country. So mm. the firsthand experience of witnessing urban transformation has given me a deep appreciation for the importance of sustainable and inclusive development practices. And I'm, I'm still connected with my professors and friends from SEPT University, and they are doing amazing work in the country. So uh, it, it, it still helps me stay motivated and inspired to, to work uh, in a certain way. Huh. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. That like it's almost examples of thing, things to <laughs> to look out for, to be aware, to be aware of as as uh, places you work for now are, are growing or dealing with growth yeah. pressures. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, very cool. And so um, I, you know, I'm always uh, the, the, sometimes the first job in local government um, is is a way that kind of like solidifies your, your path. Uh, I'm curious, is there anything you know either? You know, in that I think you, the council of governments that you worked for, or in maybe your first full time job, like was there anything in that first job that you got to work on that you're like, oh, I've made the right choice. I want to stay in local government and, and keep keep with this career. <laughs> for sure, there were many uh, examples. Uh, one that I, I can think of. Um, so I had the opportunity to create a GIS database for several communities within the COG or Council of Governments, and this experience was particularly rewarding due to its Mm. collaborative nature. 
um, I, I vividly remember going on site with printed maps and studying areas affected by blight. So this was again in my first or second year in the United States. So being on uh, uh, in a foreign country and understanding the challenges there, I, and I love maps. So seeing the place and reality, um, it totally added this dynamic aspect to my work and it made mm. it a really fulfilling experience. It, it solidified my passion for local government. I knew I was on the right track. I, and and I knew that I wanted to be in long uh, in local government for the long term. Very cool. Well, and, and working on blight, that's like the opposite problem of like what you saw in India, right? Like that's <laughs> it's the opposite of growth, right? That you're, that right. you're trying to find solutions for and figure out. So true. And and see, I was also looking at the availability of CDBG funds. So mm-hmm. that was also exciting because. Um, resources are available. That is a different situation. Sometimes um, the the resources are not as plentiful in developing countries. So knowing that there are resources like that, um, the GIS data, all of that being available, that makes so much of a difference um, in a project and in the ability to make real change happen. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Um... Well, and, uh, I think I mentioned this in your bio, but one of your 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 first kind of jobs out of grad school was working as a ICMA local government management fellow um, in Decatur. And so I I think you know I'm, I'm curious about this from two perspectives for folks you know trying to get into local government and, and seeing this as maybe one option that they could take as like you know a first a first step in their career. And then for organizations that either have or, or are thinking about having a fellow, what what was your experience like, you know, doing a fellowship and what was maybe some of the things that you got to work on? I had an amazing experience as an ICMA fellow. So mine was a two year fellowship. It can be mm-hmm. either one year or two years. It can be with one organization or you might have to split your time with a city and county or two cities, depending on the budget um, and the projects that the host organization has for you. Um, with For me, I only had to work for the city of Decatur for the two years and I was mainly stationed in the city manager's office. And during my fellowship, a notable project that kind of put me on the map uh, originated from a cryptic email that I got uh, from the city manager, the former city manager of Decatur, who was also the first female president of ICMA, uh, Peggy Meris. So she tasked me with conducting research on bird scooters. Oh, now, <laughs> Ben, this is 2018 when yep. electric scooters were not yet a common sight. So it left me perplexed as I tried to grasp the context of her request. Um, But the initial research I conducted on e-scooters evolved into the establishment of a steering committee dedicated to regulating their usage. So steering committees are so common in our world. And and I think that's really helpful to have a steering committee to do the research. Mm. Um, I, I, I was absolutely privileged to lead the committee, collaborate with city staff from every department Um, I got to interact with the city attorney, representatives from e-scooter companies, the Georgia Municipal Association, and various other stakeholders. I facilitated community input opportunities, drafted and implemented an ordinance, and witnessed firsthand the connection between theoretical knowledge and practical experiences. So overall, it was just such a great experience. Um, that, That was one such notable project from my fellowship and uh, another aspect of the ICMA fellowship that I absolutely love is that fellows can do rotations in every department. Mm. So in Decatur, uh, we were allowed to have one day rotations in every department. So fire, PD, public works, finance, municipal court. So going to these uh, departments and divisions, spending one day, it really helped me understand the city's services. And overall, it absolutely fueled my passion for community service. Um, Towards the end of that process, um, there was a staffing shortage in our human resources division. Mm -hmm. And I was also curious to learn more about HR. 
Yeah. So my city manager and the HR director, we decided, okay, let's do a three-month rotation in HR. And then we got hit by COVID. So oh, wow. <laughs> we had more <laughs> staffing shortage issues. Um, and it turned into a 12-month rotation. But it helped me learn so much about HR. I have a different level of respect for HR professionals. It, it, the experience um, highlighted the role that individuals play in the functioning of the organization as one cohesive unit. Like mm. every, every for, for when you are in the city manager's office, the information is coming to you, but HR knows every employee. So it, it absolutely helped me with knowing so much more about how benefits and recruitment related efforts actually function. All of it happens in the back end. So not everyone knows how how hard it is to make things function so smoothly. Um, And and I I absolutely enjoyed that experience. Now I can say that when I was doing it (laughs) at that time, I was like, what am I doing? There were so many questions, but I had great mentors. Um, And and after the end of that experience, uh, I got promoted to the operations analyst role. And Mm -hmm. uh, I enjoyed that experience as well overall indicator I, I had such a great experience i i hold immense love and gratitude for so many individuals who played an important role in my professional journey the city manager andrea she has been an exceptional source of inspiration and guidance the former deputy city manager the assistant city manager <laughs> teresa who also nominated me to be on the elgl top local gov influencers yeah <laughs> the city clerk, our finance director, HR director, office manager, everyone, all all my colleagues were phenomenal. And yeah. it makes a difference having the dedicated elected officials, a great community. Um, I just got a message from a community member yesterday checking on me. So that doesn't <laughs> happen very often one year no, after. No, it does not. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I absolutely... Uh, love to cater and it'll, the city will always hold a special place in my life and my heart. Yeah. Well, I want to transition to talk about your, your current role in, in organization, but, um, but I, I wanted to kind of, to highlight a couple of things you said there that, you know, for a successful, it sounds like what, what made your fellowship really successful was one, you got to own something, own a project, a, that, that micro mobility scooter <laughs> yeah. issue you got to like really own and work on and, and develop and then you got exposure to all the different things that the city does. So you could see what you liked or, or were curious to learn more about and, and then um, begin to dive deep on HR, especially during a, a time like COVID. That's um, talk about a learning experience. I can't imagine <laughs> what that was like. <laughs> yeah, essential staffing, recruitment. Um, I was considered essential staff there for a while. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, but uh, for maybe our listeners that might be, you know, still in grad school or about to enter or still early on in their career, what were you looking for out of a fellowship when you were going through like, how do I <laughs> do, what do I, what am I looking for for an or out of an organization or how do you kind of decide or, and I don't, I'm always, I'm always uncertain how the process works for the fellowship, but like, how did you decide, how did you end up indicator and how'd you choose that, that organization? Um, like, what were you looking for, I guess? Yeah, I attended um, my first ICMA conference in 2017, and that's when I found out about the fellowship. They had a dedicated meeting where ICMA current fellows and alumni um, alum were all present to talk about the fellowship. So I had a list of questions prepared, and <laughs> I um, bugged a lot of uh, former fellows and asked all those questions, which helped me know that I wanted to go with an organization that offered a two-year fellowship. I I was very clear about that. Um, So how the process works is that you submit an application to ICMA. Um, ICMA staff review the applications and decide if you get to be a finalist or not. Uh, and it's a graduate student. I mean, you have to have completed your graduate degree to apply for the fellowship. So I applied when I was in my final year of grad school. Um, and by the time I graduated or a month before I graduated, I, I started receiving interview requests from organizations. So once you become a finalist with ICMA, 
your application gets sent to all the host organizations mm. that are accepting fellows for the next year or for the next two years. And after that, it's like any other interview or job recruitment process where you can get rejections, you can get interview calls, and um, all of those things continue happening like any other uh, job application process. So mm-hmm. I went down to Decatur, met with the team, uh, absolutely fell in love with the, the, the cute community, the beautiful uh, trees and the, the original Atlanta vibe. Uh, I, I absolutely enjoyed that. So overall, the process can be time-taking because you're applying in sept- between September through December, but you only get placed around between April and maybe June, July. So um, as I said, it can take a while. So that can be a little frustrating, especially as you're getting out of grad school and there is this uncertainty yeah. about your next steps. Mm-hmm. So um, what, what I would suggest is reach out to the host community that you've interviewed for, especially because that's the budget season. So a lot mm-hmm. of agencies want to hire you, but they are also working on budget-related deadlines. So reminders are not a, a bad problem to yeah, have yeah. for <laughs> the, the city managers and city clerks and budget managers who, who want to hire you eventually. Yeah. No, yeah, that's good advice. Well, and, and I think what you said also, like asking a lot of questions about people that have had similar roles, like for any anyone trying to break into local government or find that first job, that, that's a great way to do it is ask a lot of questions and talk to a lot of people that have kind of walked that path before because they, they can give you some some good guidance or at least examples of how how, how they've done it. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, what, what brought you to Elk Grove? I mean, it sounds like you, you really enjoyed working for Decatur. So how did you end up kind of in, in Elk Grove, California? <laughs> <laughs> it was two things. One, my my husband, uh, mm-hmm. we got married last year and he was in California. We were considering jobs uh, in California and Georgia. Uh, Elk Grove was uh, the perfect fit because of the job. So the second reason is the actual job profile. So I'm a management analyst, as I mentioned, in the strategic planning and innovation division. Uh, So I report to the director of strategic planning and innovation, just such a cool division name, right? I I was like, (laughs) I want to work for that department. I want to know more about the activities that they are involved in. Um, strategic plan itself, creating that, having a general plan or a strategic plan to go to, um, that makes such a difference in how the organization functions, knowing that um, innovation is something that's important, but also remembering that it's not the responsibility of just this one department. It's something that has to come from every individual and from every Mm -hmm. department. Mm -hmm. So that's something we are working on, as I mentioned, with the Innovation Academy. That's something I'm talking with developing a curriculum for with my colleagues. So that's something we are super excited about. Um, and, and I think overall, that's what I, I knew that um, that's something I want in my profile. I want to get more yeah. involved in continuous improvement related work um, and innovation based uh, projects. Very cool. Well, yeah, and you mentioned the Innovation Academy. So I'm, I'm curious what what um, led the city to want to pursue something like that? Um, we just had, uh, you know, Kayla Barber uh, Peretta on from the city of Brighton, Colorado, and she she stood up a, a very similar um, sort of academy in that city, and we, we got into really the nitty gritty with her. But I'm I'm curious for you, for you guys, like why did why does Elk Grove want to start one of those, and then what's kind of the vision vision for the academy? Yeah, I heard Kayla's podcast. Kayla rocks. I mean, yes, everyone <laughs> working on Innovation Academies, you know, there is a certain vibe. Um, mm-hmm. They are more outgoing. They are research-oriented, outcome-focused, data-driven organizations. And El Grove is very much like that. So it aligns with our organizational goals, our objectives. So this is something that my boss, the director of strategic planning and innovation and our city manager, our city council, everyone is very supportive of bringing this innovation academy in for our city employees. Um, And I think the drive came from my boss. Um, They they really wanted to have this program in-house for for our staff. And I know there are so many other jurisdictions that have also 
started these programs. I, I think Sugarland, Texas, we have uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee has a similar program like Denver does. Um, we also reached out to a couple of other cities. So with local government, as you know, the information is all available. It's accessible to you. They And folks are so nice. They want you to have yep. the materials. And um, we, we just got so inspired by the Denver Peak Academy that we knew that this has to be a, an option for Elk Grove folks as well. Yeah. Yeah, well said. And yeah, people, people, uh, information's available and people want to share too, which is, which is the cool part. All right. Absolutely. Um, so I read um, one of the other areas you work on is around uh, performance management and the city's kind of performance management program. So uh, can you talk a little bit about, about that work? What does that, what does that look like in Elk Grove? Yeah. So I worked on performance management a little bit in Decatur as well. Over there, it was managed by our, city clerk who is also the budget director and they use ICMA's open access benchmarking tool which I really like going back to um, because it helps you compare the city's or jurisdiction's performance with other communities and it provides amazing benchmarks and performance indicators so I, I still use that here but for our program step one as always, was researching what does performance management look like in other agencies? What are the best practices that we can learn from? So specifically, we looked at Minneapolis, Scottsdale, and Stockton, among several other municipalities. I reached out to folks there and uh, shout out to Jonathan from Minneapolis, who has recently announced that he's moving to Long Beach as the chief innovation officer. And Katie from Stockton, they shared their materials as well. As I mentioned, local gov folks rock and <laughs> share all the materials. So with Minneapolis, they had a specific um, approach to this performance management, to their performance management program. And we are using a lot of the uh, materials that they actually used there as well. So starting with workshops, with every division to work on their mission, vision, values, and goals. So having those meetings um, in a collaborative way to ensure that the performance management program aligns with the broader organizational objectives. And our aim was to make the program outcome focused. And, mm -hmm. and I've been thinking about this a lot with uh, a program that I'm now a part of, Polco and ICMA, um, have collaborated to create a data-driven decision-making certificate program. And that also talks a lot about making outcome-focused decisions. So coming back to the city's performance indicators, um, the, the attempt has been to align it with the divisional goals. So it sounds so easy to create the goals, mission, and vision for your division but we realized through the workshops that it's not as easy because you are trying to get it down to three to five goals mm. that align with your department, that align with the organization and what the city council wants from you. And you know, there are so many expectations because eventually these goals will be published in your budget document. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a living, breathing document for you to go back to, which means these goals cannot be taken um, for granted. You you want to make sure that any indicators associated with those goals have meaning for you and for the constituents, for our residents. Um, and having that, it, it just makes so much of a difference. And we are at the final stage of completing or finalizing our performance indicators and our goal is to have the performance data available on a user-friendly dashboard using Power BI. Um, this would provide a centralized platform for tracking and monitoring performance indicators, making the data easily accessible and also as going back to the data-driven discussions and decision-making processes, it, it all goes back to being data-driven as an organization, being innovative like that. So yeah. 
yeah, overall, the re revamping process, it involved research, benchmarking, collaboration with every division, uh, and again, focus on the outcomes with the mm -hmm. aim of creating this transparent and data-driven performance management program. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, and, and so I'm curious, like, it's one thing to to want to do that from the city manager's office or, or a, a you know department like yours and that's over innovation and strategic planning and performance. But how have you kind of engaged with some of the other departments in the city to kind of bring them along or get them trained on, on some of these concepts? Like, how has that kind of gone working with, you know, because you need those those folks to be bought in. So how have you guys kind of done that? Yeah, that's a great question, Ben. That's so important. We knew that the buy-in from our city manager, from all the executive staff members was critical to ensuring that all the division heads and the staff members were on board with the plan. So to get the organizational buy-in, we first had a meeting with the city manager to make them aware of our plan. And then we presented to the executive team. Uh, we also gave them a small taste of what the workshops would look like because the workshops were long. Uh, the first one to create the vision, mission, values, and goals was an hour long. Yeah. And the second one to actually get to the indicators, that was two hours long. And there were several one-on-one -on -one meetings after that because there was so much homework to do. Yeah. Uh, so I think it made our staff members think like they were back in school mm -hmm. uh, to, to get to this work. And there was some math involved. And once you see math, sometimes people just want to run away. <laughs> <laughs> um, but making sure that the process was interactive. Um, and I think one incentive that always helps is food to yeah, keep oh, everyone yeah. <laughs> engaged and nourished to get through the final steps of getting to the, the outcome-focused performance indicators. Um, and of course, there are some departments, like with the timing, sometimes there are other pressing issues that come up due to which finalizing the performance indicators is just not a priority. So mm -hmm. we have been very flexible with those departments saying, okay, the budget is due this month, so let's meet next month. Or, okay, you're severely understaffed at this time, Let's do this next quarter, maybe next year. Whatever works for you, we are here for you. So having mm -hmm. that flexibility has also helped a lot. Yeah. And there, there are some departments that don't see the value in this. And, and for that, again, having the conversations. Once we have the database in place on the city website, I think that will make a difference. When you see the information displayed in a certain way, that will lead them to get back on the on the discussion about okay let's let's see what we can do what kind of data we can gather and what story we can tell about the work that we do in this division so we always say that it's about telling your story yeah. in the best way you want us to yeah yeah you know that yeah that's great uh, advice and and uh and you guys are approaching it. It seems, it seems like in a good way, like trying to be a resource, not a burden on, on departments and then finding ways to kind of tell their story and, and give them and help them. Right. Like not <laughs> again, be another source of work, but um, exactly. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Elevate their story. That's a great, um, awesome. Very cool. Uh, that that's, uh, I'm, I'm jealous of all the, the work you're doing in that, in that department. That's awesome. Um, so another kind of uh, area that I wanted to talk with you about, um, or part of what I, what I wanted to have you on the, the podcast was uh, your role with the International Network of, of Asian Public Administrators. So um, can you tell our listeners maybe that that aren't that aren't familiar with I, and is it INAPA or INAPA? Um, <laughs> can you tell them a little about the uh, organization and, and maybe how you got involved? Yes. So it is INAPA and uh, a little bit of the historical background during ICMA's 2015 annual conference, the keynote speaker prompted attendees to identify themselves within various groups. Mm -hmm. And when the category Asian was called out, only a few individuals stood among the crowd of thousand or more. So yeah. this revealed a significant imbalance, right? Um, and, and we found that uh, less than 1% of ICMA's full members 
were of Asian heritage, and this data is from 2013, so it has definitely wow. changed. Yeah. Uh, but still, That's really low. I'm surprised. Yeah, it's That's so wow. low. Exactly. So in response, those few individuals came together with the goal of addressing the disparity. And uh, with ICMA support, a survey was conducted to gather insights on the interests and concerns of ICMA members and others serving Asian public American communities. The survey results were presented at the 2016 annual conference, I think in Kansas City, and it led to the establishment of the ICMA Asian Pacific American Affinity Group. And it started having a LinkedIn presence as well. And within just a few months, the group grew to include 150 members. And now, as you know, we are known as the INAPA or the International Network of Asian Public Administrators. And as of yesterday, we had more than 350 members. And of course, we are still affiliated to, IC uh, to ICMA. Wow. Yeah, that, that's great that you guys have continued to grow. Um, what, are, what are some of the things that you guys do, either you know, events or resources, or how, how are you guys kind of helping, helping folks of that have that identity kind of connect with one another and, and, and feel support? Yeah, so INAPA aims to promote excellence among public administrators of Asian heritage by developing emerging leaders, providing support and resources, facilitating networking opportunities, and serving as a platform for collaboration. So the organization is led by an exceptional board of directors, and we have regular meetings held on the second Friday of each month. Personally, I became acquainted with INAPA when I was attending my first ICMA conference in San Antonio, and I accidentally started attending the board meetings that were held <laughs> um, via Zoom. And I just enjoyed the discussions so much uh, that I didn't realize that, oh, I'm not a board member. I'm not supposed to be here. <laughs> and eventually, I was asked to run for the VP role. And the bylaws changed that year. I won and became the president-elect. And oh, no. My term as president ends this year in the fall, but I have enjoyed the experience so much, Ben. INAPA is amazing. Um, and about the events and resources. So INAPA organizes informal virtual gatherings called Boba Breaks on the second Friday of each month at 9 a.m. Pacific time. So these virtual sessions provide a great space for Asian public administrators, students, and vendors serving the public sector to connect and establish professional relationships. We also have um, a mentorship program. Applications are actually being accepted for our INAPA mentorship program until June 30th. For This is for our fall program. Uh, we also have a lot of webinars from time to time. Actually, we have a webinar coming up in partnership with some of our other affiliate organizations on July 11th at 1 p.m. Pacific time. And the topic is, do you really know what your community members want? Hmm. Such a great question. I'm, I'm already excited about it. Um, yeah. The details about this webinar will be on our website soon. But uh, we are also very active on social media. We have a presence on, as I mentioned, on LinkedIn where we have a dedicated page and a group for INAPA. Through the page, we post job opportunities and upcoming events. We also engage with the community by liking and sharing relevant job postings, and we receive a lot of tags from recruiters. So definitely a great page to follow, to be a part of as a group. And some exciting news, we are planning to host our inaugural conference this October which will be conducted virtually. So it will be a fantastic opportunity to connect, learn, and network. Um, also, we have plans to organize our first in-person conference next year, uh, but more information about both the events, along with the registration details, schedules, and all the other exciting stuff will be added to our website soon. So stay tuned for updates. That's awesome. That's great. So we'll, we'll be sure to link to your guys' website as well as... Um some some of those uh, uh, webinars and, and events that that y'all have coming up um, in in the notes for this this episode. Awesome. So, so you Thank can you, you can find that on the on 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 the uh, website post about this episode and then in the notes. 
Um, that's great. That's really cool. Um, that, and I assume if, if our listeners go to your guys' website, they can they can learn more and, and figure out how to join and all that good stuff. That's right. Listeners can connect with me on LinkedIn or directly go to our website, send us an email request to join. Um, one thing I need to mention is that INAPA membership is currently free and we welcome new members. I would like to give a big shout out to ICMA for their ongoing support of INAPA and kudos to all the other affiliate organizations, especially the local government Hispanic network, LGHN. Network for National Forum for Black Public Administrators, NFBPA, Civic Pride, the League of Women in Government for their outstanding work in the DEI space. So all these organizations, we come together from time to time to see what other resources we could offer our members. I would highly recommend checking out the affiliate organizations if you serve the public sector, regardless of your role. They all offer great resources and networking opportunities. Yeah, yeah, well said. Those are great organizations and lots of uh, ELGO members involved with those folks as well and, um, and lots of uh, former GovLove guests that have represented those those uh, organizations. So that's, that's great. Um, very cool. So yeah, we'll be sure to link to, to your guys' um, website and then um, hopefully we can share events as, as you guys get closer to maybe your conference and all that good stuff. Awesome. Um, so I'm curious, you know, uh, as you've kind of, gotten been involved with INAPA and you guys have gotten to know your and your membership has grown. Are you seeing kind of any, I don't know, themes with what folks are interested in or, or dealing with that, you know, have that, you know, Asian identity or are there folks or, and I'm, I'm curious, is, is your membership, you know, is, are most of your members in any one part of the country or not? Like, it, it's kind of interesting that you're, this is a newer organization and, and also like, it's a, it's a growing, you know, demographic within you know the u.s and so um and we want to see kind of local government uh staff represent you know the the population that we serve so um you know having more public administrators and more local government staff that uh have that identity and and you know could be part of INAFA is, is a good is a good thing so i'm just curious if you've seen any kind of trends or any any takeaways as you've gotten to know your the, the members of INAFA or or kind of some of the the things that they're interested in or, or talking about Yeah, that's such a great question. I think we all go through this identity crisis at some point Mm -hmm. or the other, uh, this imposter syndrome of whether one can grow in this field and get to the role that they aspire to be. And one thing that we try to do from time to time is send out a survey to see what kind of webinar topics or boba break topics people would like to see. Um, We recently had a webinar in partnership with the other affiliate organizations on mental health, um, dealing with burnout and fatigue. That was highly successful as a webinar because we had more than 200 members attend it. And that, that is something that has come up quite a bit in terms of a topic that people are interested in knowing more about how to deal with burnout. And this is not just folks uh, who are part of INAPA. This is all local government professionals, of course. Um, And something else that comes up is how to get to the city management track. How Mm. do I put my best foot forward, um, make sure my manager knows that I'm ready for, for the next step. And it need not be the city manager role. It can just be ACM for now. I, I say just, but that's yeah. a huge <laughs> <laughs> role as well. So knowing when you're ready for the next step, we have had uh, some great discussions about that as well. That's something that comes up from time to time. We had a boba break about um, what were you afraid to ask your city manager? And mm. that was an exciting topic. Uh, I think we'll have to do it again sometime soon just because the conversations were still going um, even after we were closer to the yeah. 60 minutes of being done for the meeting. So it's always interesting, all these uh, topics that come up. Sometimes, um, again, it's just easier topics about how do you work in an environment where you are still a minority and you feel like your voice does not matter. Um, And these are more of the courageous conversations. These cannot be done in a, in a funny way. It it needs some 
um, a, a, a more structured approach maybe to dealing with questions like that, some more resources that need to be made available to the audience in, in how to deal with certain situations. Yeah, yeah, no, that's well said. And, and I think it's even if you don't identify with like one of those minority groups, knowing what folks are going through and like understanding that perspective and, you know, dealing with that, what that's like is, I think, valuable for, for anyone. And so just being, just understanding the, you know, what folks are talking about and, and struggling with, I think is helpful for anybody, no matter their identity, because that helps you make, form a more inclusive organization and a more inclusive profession. Yeah, that's a great point, Ben, because allies are so important. And also it's knowing that your community uh, needs to see that they are represented. So yeah. uh, having exactly. the staff members look different, uh, the, the, di- the diversity in thoughts and opinions that helps you um, just create a, a better organization overall that really helps and makes a difference. Yeah. Yeah. Well said. So that actually kind of transitions nicely into it. another question I had for you. So as part of my, you know, preparing for this interview, I read a kind of a profile that uh, you had in Humans of Public Service, which is a great uh, resource and, and something for, for folks to follow if they don't. Uh, but you talked a little bit about your experience as, like, as a non-resident alien and, and uh, in local government. And so I'm, I'm curious, you know, uh, you know, it's probably a pretty unique perspective of, uh, at least, at least in, for the organizations I've worked with, there's not been a, a ton of folks with that kind of background. So what, what's, what's that been like for, for you and like how, how have, um, have you, yeah, how, what's that been like? I'm just, um, that, that, that it's interesting that, that you brought that up as something that, um, that, you know, in, in that profile. So I was just curious if you wanted to talk more about it. <laughs> yeah. Navigating the local government space as a non-resident alien has presented some unique challenges and um, moments of unease, um, moments of uncertainty. Um, And as as I was mentioning, the identity crisis before it definitely triggers um, the identity crisis and prompts reflection on my status within the organization, the community, the country, uh, everywhere, just overall existential crisis, maybe. Um, But but it is definitely more common for Asians to be working on work visas in sectors like healthcare and IT, but it is relatively uncommon in the public sector, as you mentioned. Um, and, And just so you know, securing my visa involved participating in a lottery process. And the limited term it offers requires me to approach every long-term project and every life decision in a different way than others. Um, But but I must say that I'm very blessed to have the unwavering support of both my former and my current employers. Uh, they, They recognize the value I bring to the organization and they've been instrumental in creating this inclusive and supportive environment for me. So even though my status as a non-resident alien, it it has its challenges almost, almost unfortunately every day. But I have found the solace and strength in the understanding and support of my colleagues my employers, my Napa friends, and and mm-hmm. all my friends uh, here, um, and and back home as well. So it it absolutely reinforces the importance of fostering inclusivity and diversity in the workplace, and allowing individuals from all backgrounds to thrive and yeah. um, contribute to their fullest potential. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Well said. Well, and. and that- yeah, I wouldn't have even thought about like the the added stressor pressure of like thinking about long term, not even long term planning, like short term planning on around projects at work, and let alone you know per, your personal life. That uh, that adds a a dimension that's probably uh, probably you don't want to you wish you didn't have to deal with. I imagine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, it has been long enough that I, I know how to deal with it better than I did. Uh, yeah. when I first got here and now that I also have the support of my spouse and 
again as i mentioned all the other amazing folks around me that that definitely makes a lot of difference yeah well and, and you you highlighted that both uh, decatur and elk grove have been kind of supportive and and help sponsor i, I assume help sponsor your, your visa and you know I, as we talk about kind of recruitment in local government and trying to and finding talent like that's another you know avenue that organizations can take so i you know, and it's fair if you don't know, but I'm curious, how common is it for local governments to sponsor visas like that? I, I know, like like you said, it's, it's maybe more common in the private sector, but um, I'm wondering if if you've seen any others that are any or other organizations that are doing that, and and then like what what that would take or what it takes on the organization side to to sponsor a, a visa. Yeah, I have seen a bit of both agencies that are interested in sponsoring folks and agencies that don't want to. And in, in my opinion, given the current staffing challenges faced by so many yeah. local government agencies, it yeah. it is it is it sounds like a practical approach to seek assistance from civil engineers, uh, mm-hmm. analysts, other specialists who are in high demand. Um, I think the cost associated with the immigration attorney fees, the visa sponsorships, those can be a significant deterrent when considering candidates who are not from the U.S. Um, And there are some public sector agencies that have disclaimers that this community will not sponsor visas now or in the future. Hmm. And as an applicant, that is so disappointing when you're looking at the job description or working on the application and you see that disclaimer, but looking back at those applications and those job descriptions, I'm thinking it tells me about the organizational culture. Exactly. And yep. again, this is me. Yeah, I, I'm not sure how others feel or how others, or who, the other agencies that, that have actually put out those disclaimers, what their thought process is. Maybe they have gone through some experience uh, that made them put, put out those disclaimers. But in any case, it makes me ask, do I want to work here? Yeah. And um, at my first one-on-one meeting with my current city manager here, he said to me when we were talking about this uh, visa sponsorship, he, he said to me, we want you here. And that makes a difference in how I work every day. It helps me put my best foot forward. Not that I wouldn't have, but it, it, that, those words just mean so much to me that I'm welcome in this community, in this organization. And it just keeps me so motivated to give back to the community and to this organization. And uh, also another thing is that three agencies have reached out to me in the past three months since the piece on uh, uh, the Humans of Public Service was published. And these conversations are essential in breaking down the notion that pursuing visa sponsorships is uncommon in the public sector. Because when we start openly discussing and addressing the process, we can help agencies understand the feasibility and benefits of hiring talented individuals from around the world. So I I think it's crucial to continue advocating for more inclusive hiring practices, emphasizing the value that diverse perspectives and expertise bring to all our organizations. And by sharing experiences and engaging in these conversations, we can help shape a more inclusive and globally collaborative public service sector. So as as you mentioned, there are so many people who need for uh, them to be represented at the workplace. In Elk Grove, we have uh, I think 25% of our population is foreign born. So I think it makes a difference when yeah. they see someone who looks like them, who yep. maybe has an accent. Uh, so all of that, uh, I, I think it, it definitely makes, it makes a difference everywhere. Yeah, no, well said. I mean, that there's, uh, it's two fronts, right? It's, this is another avenue to find talent and recruit great people. Um, and then also, like, I know in organizations I work for that, like, immigrants are often a really difficult community to engage with or communicate to. And so having that perspective in, you know, in the organization and on staff on, like, what are the best ways to, you know, get information out or understand what's, what they're, you know, what they're struggling with or what, you know, what that community 
um, needs from its local government, having that perspective in-house, you know, can also make a huge difference in the kind of policies you're able to do and the programs and how that gets implemented. So that that's really well said. I, and thank you so much for, for talking about that. Uh, it's a, um, you know, I, I hope it becomes more common, but it, you know, it's a, it's a, it's really, it is a unique perspective. And so it's, it's, it's useful to kind of hear from you about that. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, sometimes um, I'm afraid for my organization and for me and my, my status here when I have these conversations. But again, if we don't have these conversations, yeah. uh, someone might not apply for a local government job. Exactly. Uh, yeah. or someone might not hire uh, a foreign national, even though they, they could have. So yeah. I, I hope it makes a difference somewhere. And well, like I, I always talk to residents and encourage them to attend events, to attend city council meetings, to be a part of different councils and boards and commissions. Um, and I, I always ask people to try and attend the Citizens Police Academy because yeah. it is so much fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Those, yeah, boards are a great way to, to serve and learn more and, and academies even even better. Um yeah, well, well, well said. And and I mean, to your point, like there are communities like Elk Grove where you know that's a that's a big chunk of the population. And so to to kind of ignore that or not think about that or not engage with that and think about it in terms of does your workforce reflect it is um, you know irresponsible as a as an organization. So it's it's definitely it's worth having the conversations and, and highlighting that uh, as an issue. Awesome. So um, you know uh, we've we've had a great conversation. Uh, that, that was a kind of an inspiring note to end on. So I, you know, one of our traditional last questions on, on GovLove is if you could be the GovLove DJ and, and pick the exit music for today's episode, uh, what song would you pick? <laughs> so Ben, this was a difficult question for me. So I, <laughs> I asked Chad GPT to help me with this question. Okay. And um, I gave it a specific instruction to help me with a Hindi song. So a okay. Bollywood song is what we'll use. Um, it's from the movie Iqbal, I-Q-B-A-L. It's an amazing movie. The song is called Ashae. I can spell it. It's A-A-S-H-A-Y-E-I-N, Ashae. It is known for its uplifting and motivational lyrics. It encourages listeners to have hope, pursue their dreams, and overcome challenges. And its inspiring message and catchy tune make it a perfect choice to leave listeners feeling motivated and empowered after the episode. So I think ChatGPT helped us find the perfect song. <laughs> that is perfect. That sounds uh, that sounds perfect. And our producer, uh, Pizza Mike, will get that queued up. And um, what a note to leave on. I, I can't believe ChatGPT GPT gave you such a great assist. That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome, awesome. Thank you, Ben. Uh, awesome. And for our listeners, that ends our episode uh, today. For today, Ash, thank you so much for coming on and talking with me. I really appreciate you, you know, sharing your experience, your expertise, and and your time. So this has been great. It was my pleasure, Ben. Thank you again for having me. Um, and for listeners, GovLove is brought to you by engaging local government leaders. And the best way to support GovLove is to become an ELGL member. Uh, you can reach ELGL online at ELGL.org, and you can find more uh, episodes of GovLove at ELGL.org/govlove or on the uh, or on Twitter at the handle at GovLove Podcast. Uh, and if you're not already, uh, you should subscribe to GovLove on your favorite podcast app or whatever you're listening to this on right now um, and share this podcast with a colleague, with a friend, with your neighbor. Help us spread the word that GovLove is the go-to place for local government stories. And with that, thank you for listening. This has been GovLove, a podcast about local government. Say